Good evening and welcome to another edition of Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. As the 2014 election date moves closer, countrywide protests over service delivery are on the rise. And experts agree that these protests are becoming more violent in nature. But a worrying trend in recent years, and even in the last month alone, has been the number of killings of protesters at the hands of police who have used deadly force in some incidents of crowd control. Well, tonight we revisit the deadly service delivery protests in Fixburg in the Free State, the bloody Marikana mining riots in Rustenburg, the violent farmers' protests in the Duerans in the Western Cape, and the recent fatal protests in Brits in the Northwest. Tonight's episode is called Deadly Force and was produced by Adele van Niekerk. A familiar scene on the South African landscape. Angry citizens take to the streets to demand a better life. A battle cry that government cannot ignore. But what happens when police fight fire with fire? The apartheid-era riot police was notorious for its use of excessive force. Acting with impunity, it unleashed its might onto anyone who publicly defined the apartheid regime. In 1995, with the dawn of democracy, the country changed the police force into a police service. This signaled a new ethos, an era in which a rights-based approach would take center stage in the law enforcement body. But the police battled to shake off some of its legacy from its apartheid past. Reports of police brutality surfaced. Cases of corruption and a growing criminal element within its own ranks, including those in top senior positions like former commissioner Jackie Salibi, did little to contain the growing negative public perception about our police. And controversy surrounding this man, Lebi's successor, did not help the ailing image of the police service. More from the practice in police, bad to train in college, to be ready for combat. These police must be able to thoroughly meet fire by fire. These police must be able to make sure that when duty calls, they use deadly force. Nobody should survive when you want to put the life of officer down. Former Police Commissioner Becky Taylor's shoot to kill statement caused ripples across the country. And it was also under Becky's tenure that the police service would change its ranks back in line with military ranks. Many warned this would signal a turn back to a militarized police force once again. The political landscape may have changed, but South Africa's social landscape remained littered with public protests. Service delivery protests in particular have become an all too familiar sight, making news headlines on an almost daily basis. Despite violent clashes between police and protesters, it would take a service delivery protest here in the small free state town of Fixburg that became a watershed moment in our public discourse about police brutality. In April 2011, police battled to control a service delivery protest that rolled out over several days into the dusty streets of this small farming town. Residents' anger was palpable. On Friday 13 April, police shot rubber bullets into the crowd to disperse them.
Andris Tatane, a 33-year-old teacher and father of two, was in the crowd that day. Tatane was confronted by police, but he remained defiant. It would be a fatal mistake. Surrounded by cameras, the police's assault of Tatani played out in front of the whole world. He collapsed moments later and died in front of the still filming cameras. The shocking images of Tatani's death made international news headlines, and the police's conduct and use of deadly force came under sharp criticism. Just more than a year after Andriy Statani's death, the gathering of thousands of striking miners on this kopi at the Lonman mine in Marikana in the northwest would unfold into the most lethal use of violence by security forces against civilians in post-apartheid South Africa. On Friday the 16th of August 2012, the protesters, armed with traditional weapons, came down from the kopi and challenged police. A tense standoff soon turned the Marikana fields into a bloody battlefield. and dusty aftermath, the shocking body count began. 34 miners died, 70 more were injured. These images would be etched onto the conscience of a stunned nation. The images of that fateful August day in 2012 would be played and replayed dozens of times in the months that followed. The Marikana Commission of Inquiry, tasked to get to the bottom of the deadly events, would study, probe and analyse the shootings from all angles as they were captured on cameras. General, I'm just going to ask you one question whether you observe what we can observe, observe that the policemen are standing next to the bodies on the ground and the bodies uh, are, not, are not being attended to by anybody, whether it's the policeman or anyone else. The police's conduct shortly after the shooting also came under scrutiny. Police Commissioner Ria Piecha was called to account for her members' actions. It's just a simple timing issue. Would you agree from what you observed that as at the time of the arrival of the mounted unit, the people lying on the ground were still not attended to and the police members were still standing around them and they were unattended? Yes or no? And my response to you is that you, you, you had an interpretation to say they were doing nothing. And that's a problem because... What we see, we've both seen, and it's common. Okay, let's continue. I give up. Must go back. An incident that sent shockwaves around the world. General Ria Piecha addressed a parade of officers stationed at Marikana. This was her message to them. Whatever happened represents the best of responsible policy. The pain that everybody is feeling is felt by all of us. But all we did was to do our job because I know we are hurting. 
I know we are bruised. I know we are challenged. And we too are human. Well, I want to be unpoliced like I want you to actually applaud yourself. After these controversial statements by Piecha, her apology to the families of the deceased minors did little to calm emotions. She was measured and careful. With a deep sense of consciousness, I am cog cognizant of the enormous pain and anguish <coughs> which the tragedy has caused our country. And without any reservation, I therefore register my sincere condolences to the families of all who tragically lost their lives during this incident. It is within me, as a leader, Coming up after the break, self-defense or trigger happy? Are our police equipped to handle violent protests? Public scrutiny of the police's conduct during protests has intensified since the Marikana shootings, but since then, more reports have surfaced of protesters being killed in other riots. But studies by a municipal research group show that these protests have become more violent over recent years. We've seen a sustained level of violent activity. Certainly, uh, if 2014 is anything to go by, the last month we have seen an upsurge. I think it's also the type of violence that, that's of concern, is that we have, in communities like Beckersdale, sustained violent protest activity. So it's the intensity of that violence that is the real concern. The month of January this year alone has seen violent protests erupt across the country. Eight protesters have died to find violent clashes with police. And in one of the most violent protests in recent months, angry residents in Tanin burned down the local police station with petrol bombs and clashed with officers. We also lost a 15-year-old boy. Uh, allegations that the police were involved in his killing. So all the members who were there um, were there on duty. We have taken uh, or they have handed over their um, firearms for ballistic testing. So that is where we are now. We are waiting for test results as well as the post-mortem results from the 15-year-old um, victim. In the aftermath of the Brit protests, the police's top brass acted swiftly. At a media briefing, it was announced that six officers were arrested for improper conduct. Safety and Security Minister Nartim Tetwa also conceded that the wrong ammunition was used by officers. One of the uh, things which was uh, a found to be a problem was the use of uh, what we call gauge 12 uh, round, uh, and those are the rounds with uh, pellets. And those were discontinued in the service in 2006 already, and people were, were informed about that. So this is one area uh, which uh, was not uh, uh, observed, as it were. With seeming discrepancies in the conduct of riot police, critics are demanding answers. Most importantly, are police equipped and trained to handle violent protests? Where they are falling short, I think, is in terms of their capacity, their numbers. And this, in part, I think, is the result of a restructuring process that Jackie Seleve uh, called for in 2006 when he was still National Commissioner. The result of that was that um, this unit, the Public Order Police units, lost about half their units countrywide and uh, about half their, their trained members. But police management is adamant that the riot police unit is capable of handling mass protests. 
and says the violent nature of these protests means officers must defend their own lives. These members are members of public order policy and they are, they are experienced members in that field. They are trained in that field. Whilst there are rights of citizens, there are responsibilities that goes with those rights. And if we mutually all abide by the laws that govern how we do our work, I'm sure we'll get to an even more efficient public order policing space. Since Andri Tatane's controversial death in 2011 and following the watershed Marikana killings in 2012, there has been growing calls for police to review its riot police policy. In a moment, will the run-up to elections see more deadly protests? In January last year, a long drawn out strike by the farm worker sector in the Duerens in the Western Cape culminated in a massive gathering of disgruntled workers. It was one of the longest sustained protest efforts that kicked off a year before by workers demanding a living wage. We have reached a number of agreements on how do we ensure that we have peaceful marches and that we reduce the levels of violence significantly on all sides. Yet three people lost their lives in clashes with police over this period. It didn't stop thousands to continue pouring onto the streets to voice their demands. We measure violence as anything that affects or compromises the rights of others, where infrastructure, whether it's public or private, is, is burnt or destroyed. Um, where people are impeded in their ability to go to work or school, of course, where there are arrests, deaths or injuries. So it's quite a broad definition and it, it really comes down to where people within the community are not able to go about their day-to-day -day business without being impinged on by the protest activity. In Brits, a sleepy town in the northwest, it's difficult to imagine that some of the most violent clashes with police played out here over the last few weeks. It was residents' desperate pleas for running water that sparked unrest in this otherwise peaceful community. Answer experts, this drive for basic needs will continue pushing citizens out onto the streets in South Africa's all too familiar protest culture. We see the start of protest being over quite a specific issue. We'll see one issue um, like water shortages prompting protests. As they escalate, um, we see a number of uh, issues coming to the fore, and that's, that's also when the violence comes into play. We see um, disillusion with governance structures, we see quite a general set of, of demands being overlaid, but at the core there's usually a demand for basic services that drives most protests. The Human Rights Commission has highlighted government's slow response to basic service delivery demands as one of the core problems that must be addressed to avoid violent protests. Government must not wait uh, until people protest before they give them proper service delivery. Uh, it is surprising why, where they are aware there is no water, there is a shortage of any service relating to socio-economic right. That is not done in time, it's only addressed when people go and protest. I think preemptive steps need to be taken to make sure that it is not even necessary to protest. Tsepo Babuneng was afraid of losing the roof over his head and that of his family. He was the sole breadwinner in this extended family. Tsepo lived here in the dusty streets of Durban Deep, a former mining community in Ruedepoort, Johannesburg. Hard living conditions and lack of basic services are part of life here, a fate shared by millions across South Africa. But when the community received eviction notices a week ago from a private developer, it was the last they could handle and took to the streets in angry protests. Officially, 
Anthony says when Tsepo got to the protest action, he was positive and wanted to know what was going to happen. He wanted to know when a breakthrough will come, and he was hoping the protest will benefit the tenants. Tsepo became one of the latest protest victims killed at the hands of police. Officers claim it was an accident after they fired a warning shot when a group of protesters stormed their vehicle. In unprecedented swift police action, four officers were arrested for Tsepo's death. But there seems to be little faith that police action will be kept in check. According to a study by the ISS, police brutality has increased by more than 300 percent over the last decade. Very few cases result in convictions. We are now supposed to be in a human rights era of policing, but because of the crime, because of a lack of leadership, um, because of a clamoring of the public out there for the police to do something, um, and because of also, I think, a lack of training, especially in these cases of public order policing, and, and the lack of, of training of public, public order police officers to use minimum force uh, without aggravating the circumstances, but to still keep control of the situation. There, there's very little ability to do this kind of thing. Our police killings of civilians has led to two recent scathing reports by global organizations. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have both questioned police's capacity for crowd control and the frequent use of deadly force. The, the police has to maintain a, a kind of order, maintain, uh, protect property and so forth, but they are supposed to do so with using minimum force to protect also the right of protesters, plus the right of the life and the bodily integrity of the protesters. The police facing protesters, I think they must use means which are not lethal against protesters. It is only in the event where their lives are really threatened that they can use only the force that is necessary to avert damage or injury on them or a threat of death. Government shoots down accusations that the police has become more militarized and therefore willing to use deadly force. There is nothing like, like militarized police. Um, there may be military ranks used, but in terms of the philosophy, in terms of the prescripts, the law, everything which governs the, the police, they remain within that kind of uh, space. You can call uh, your police service or police force whatever you want to call it. What is important is that the, 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 the fundamentals, the foundation, uh, and the posture of the police, what is it that from recruitment you take uh, your members through? 2014 is an election year, and as they say in politics, anything can happen. Service delivery will remain a burning issue in the months to come. But are the violent clashes over the last weeks an indication of what lies ahead? What we're seeing at the moment is a very worrying trend. We're seeing um, police are not being seen as a supportive force for communities, not as a, as a force as envisaged, as envisaged by the regulations of gathering acts, a force that would marshal protests, and these protests not being organized in advance by community leaders. So we see a complete downward spiral of relations. Um, we see police being targeted, uh, councillors being targeted, and really a standoff between police and communities. The commu police, unfortunately, this year in any event, responding with excessive force. Um, hopefully it's a trend that will be arrested. Um, hopefully top police management will make sure that public policing protocol is being used correctly. Well, certainly a controversial topic, and I'm sure you'll have some strong views on this matter. Now, do share them with us, and you can do that via Twitter, our official special assignment Facebook page, or you can email us at 
truth and sabc.co.za. Well, do join us again next week when we point out the issues that matter.